Well, from the shooting in Colorado Springs to an attack on a local gay bar and a rash of druggings and robberies in Hell's Kitchens, New York, New, in Hell's Kitchen, New York's LGBT community is justifiably on edge this week. And now leaders are encouraging everyone to stay vigilant. Richard Giacovis goes through the protections being put in place. On the night before Thanksgiving, a normally big party night, the LGBTQ plus community is on edge. There is a lot of things happening in the world right now, especially for the LGBTQ community. It is concerning. Yeah, I'm not necessarily afraid of the hate either. It's really about just being precautious. Makoa and David identify as queer, both men deciding not to party tonight. Making the decision to not go out in like during times where of like high traffic. The worry comes as attacks ramp up, specifically attacks on gay men. The deadly gay club shooting in Colorado earlier this week, along with a brick throwing incident at a gay bar in Hell's Kitchen are two of the most recent attacks. How you doing, Justin Chairs? He, him, his. Hello, my name is Jessica Wilcox. She, her. Sam Fine. He, him, his. My name is Gabriela Romero, and I use she, her pronouns. Here in New York, law enforcement officials say several indictments and arrest warrants have been issued after a string of robberies and assaults targeting gay bars left two men dead. Stephanie Goss now with more from our NBC News investigation. New York City's Hell's Kitchen, one of Manhattan's most dynamic neighborhoods, a favorite spot for the LGBTQ community. Now a target, the NYPD says, for thieves, using a debilitating and sometimes deadly cocktail of drugs to steal from their victims, like 33-year-old John Umberger. He just loved the energy of the city. Umberger came to New York last spring for work and fun. He ended up here at the queue. His mother says there's security camera footage of him leaving late at night with two unidentified men. Umberger's body was discovered in the apartment that he had been staying in. His family says his phone and wallet were gone and roughly $20,000 had been drained from his account. For the people who may not know, what is it that you do? Uh, so I'm a special education teacher. I also sit on the board uh, for Citizen Action New York. I'm the vice president of NAACP as well as a small business owner. Oh, you're being modest. You also forgot to tell people that you're running. Oh, that's it, right. The big thing is I ran for assembly for the 111th district and I'll be running again in 2024 for New York State Assembly 111th district as it stands right now. <laughs> so tell us, what actually got you into wanting to be involved in politics and uh, special uh, education? Absolutely. Uh, for politics, for me, I was tired of watching um, the same old politicians do the same old thing, show up, shake hands, uh, but not really fighting for the people not doing what needs to be done, not taking uh, their word and what they need. Uh, we always assume what people want instead of doing, just going out and talking to people. So I became tired of it. I got tired of having them come to my school and tell my kids they care about my kids. In reality, I couldn't continue to let my kids hear that lie. Uh, I couldn't let the politicians come into my classroom and tell them that they're fighting for their future when in reality, they were just fighting for status quo. Uh, so for me, when I got into education, it was always about helping the youth. I loved always working with our kids. I loved working with children of all ages. And I've always had the ability to disseminate information in different ways so people can learn. I love helping people learn. I love giving away what I know and knowledge that I have. I'm not a good at being a secret keeper. So I want people to have as much information as they possibly can. So it was the height of activism, at least in like my lifetime. Um, after the murder of George Floyd and there was like a lot of um, frankly just like opportunities for activism so much more than my regular position where like a local school would ask me to help do you know your rights presentation and like, occasionally or like bar associations would have like little panels maybe I'd sit on one or Albany Law would like invite me back for something there were so many um, ways to get involved and I got excited about that. And it was something that I cared deeply about, the criminal legal system, like first and foremost, like at the front of everyone's minds. Um, and so for the first time, in my life again, for the first time, it, it felt like I um, 
was surrounded by a lot of people that felt like-minded to what I feel. I like meaning the criminal legal system is totally corrupt. That um, uh, black and brown people are being prosecuted, murdered, abused, um, harassed at a higher rate than others. People are realizing these concepts. Like these are concepts that I've I've been in the trenches with as a defense attorney for so long. So it was invigorating, frankly, to to be um, surrounded by other people that are like, we have to do something about this. And so. Um, I think everyone kind of felt that too, obviously, during that time, and uh, I was just, you know, wanted to get more involved, and there was an open spot in my neighborhood that the prior town council member that had been there for like 25, 30 years, and he was wonderful, an absolutely um, historic advocate, uh, he was leaving his position, so there was this open spot, and my friends and even like colleagues in the neighborhood were like, oh my gosh, you should run. And I thought, I would never do that, it's a cop out. Like, why would I be a politician? That's disgusting. <laughs> it's like, and you can laugh, I can see. <laughs> That's how I felt. That's literally how I felt. I thought like, oh my God, I can't, do you want me to be a politician? That means I like, can't go to my favorite bars or I can't, you know, like swear or I can't like wear cute skirts anymore. I don't know. Like I had this like different perception of like what a politician was that was like gross and like conservative and like annoying. Uh, and I held that position for a while. I, I really was like, no, stop, like I'm not doing this. And then it wasn't until I talked to um, one of my like strongest mentors in politics um, who's really involved with the Working Families Party, which is like a conversation for another day. These like, um, the, the system of Democrat and Republican is like really broken. So there's many different like smaller um, political parties. So Working Families Party, um, people from that group kind of approached me and were like, you need to do this and we will, and like, there's resources out there to help you and like, you should apply for our endorsement and blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't until that conversation that I really started taking it seriously. And I thought like, okay, like, let me see. So I call my mom, obviously. <laughs> and you've met Doris, check. I call my mom and I'm like, I think I wanna run for office. And um, she's like, okay, what do you need me to do? And I know I'm getting super long-winded, but like basically um, what started as me and Doris in my kitchen being like, what do we do? Ended up turning into this like really empowering and beautiful movement, which was surrounded around like honesty and integrity and transparency and like all these concepts that I thought when I was originally running were real, <laughs> but like you can still be a human being and be flawed and um, make mistakes as I bet we'll talk about later um, and just admit them and be honest. And people really, and I, of course people want that because that's like what people want in politics right now. Like look at George Santos, like look at these politicians, look at Cuomo, like even in New York State, like look at these politicians that are lying and getting elected. And it's awkward because once they get elected, like, what do you do about that? People are really upset and it creates this distrust in the political system, which is really sad to see. And so, um, long story short, uh, we, we really started with nothing. And then we created this team around people that were really like-minded, um, Working Families Party, um, DSA, Democratic Socialists, um, all these like, uh, criminal justice minded, um, working families minded groups and people. And then it was just like people coming out of the woodworks to help. <laughs> like it would just be like a DM, like, Hey, can I help volunteer? And it was just amazing. And so we have this really great team of volunteers like that just came together and, um, made it work. So it was really special and it was extremely hard. And, um, when people ask me, which might be your next question, but people ask like, how did you win? Like, how do you do that? It's because you work hard. Like you literally just have to, every single day after work, because I was also a public defender. <laughs> I had like a massive felony trial, like right in the middle of my campaign. But like, I'm, I'm an attorney during the day and then I come home and the minute I come home, I'm going for a run to keep my mental sanity. <laughs> and then I'm going on the doors and I'm just knocking on doors until like an hour after the sun goes down. And that was every single fucking day. Uh, and it worked, people, it worked. So anyways, yeah. that's how. And, <laughs> and at, it was at, during COVID. Uh-huh, period. 
It was literally during COVID, I remember that. Well, I really credit my interest in politics um, to my grandfather. I was very close with him and he worked his whole life towards uh, pushing for a universal single payer healthcare system. I think it was just those set of values, this idea of justice that healthcare is a human right, that basically certain human needs, basic needs should be a right, the government should guarantee that everyone has them. Um, I think that's really what like, piqued my interest in it. And growing up, um, you know, I think just as from a family where we talked about these issues a lot and you know, I wanted to get involved and wanted to make a difference and had these set of values. So when I um, moved to Albany, I've been in the capital region for about 15 years um, and I was working in the assembly here and I just decided, you know, I want to run on my own. I want to be able to have more of a direct impact and carry out the values that I believe in and make an impact in, in the community here. So that, that's what brought me to this position. Well, uh, I've been practicing law for about 25 years now. Back then it was like a little bit less. It was 2019. And um, I've been working for the court system and I really uh, find it um, very gratifying to help people through the court system because it's not a place where anybody wants to go. That's not your first choice. I want to go to court and especially city court because it's where most small claims and most uh, unrepresented litigants uh, appear. Uh, and so I, I enjoyed helping people through the court system and I thought I wanted to take a swing at it um, and a seat came open. So um, although I was not um, endorsed by the Democratic Party. I ran as a Democrat for the primary. I did lose that primary, but that's okay. Um, I wanted people to have a choice uh, for who to vote for, and if they chose me, they made a choice. If they didn't choose me, they made a choice as well. And when I lost the primary, I supported my opponent, who was Bill Kelly, who is now a city court judge, and he's an excellent judge. So uh, that's what I did. I think the majority of the issues that came up were uh, how litigants are very intimidated by the court, court process, which it's antiquated. When you read a law book or the, the procedure in any court, it's very um, confusing and it's not written for a lay person. So uh, one of the uh, things that the chief judge a couple years ago, his name was Jonathan Lippman, he's since retired, he uh, implemented an initiative called the Access to Just Justice Initiative. And it was, a, it was a, a program whereby the court would assist a litigant, a pro se litigant or an unrepresented litigant, into uh, understanding the procedure. Uh, not giving that litigant an added advantage, but helping that litigant navigate through the complexities. And when I was working for, at first, John Egan, then Glenn Bruning, and now Jim Ferreira, all Supreme Court judges, um, we took that very seriously and uh, litigants felt comfortable contacting chambers and it was a really good program and, we, and I, I wanted to continue that in the city court. I'd say I learned a lot about the key issues and I continue to learn and they continue to just shift a little too from going door to door, from talking to people to showing up to meetings, you know, people reach out to me. I mean, right now I hear, you know, housing is a huge issue, the cost of uh, housing, uh, the rent prices are hiking up, and it's becoming more and more unaffordable. We're seeing more homeless people on our streets because of that. Um, we're seeing an uptick in mental health issues. I think COVID was a big factor in that. Um, but you know, one theme, definitely just the um, lack of opportunities for young people in this community, um, in the South End and Arbor Hill where I represent. Um, and part of that, you know, people talk about a lack of programs for the youth, you know, a big part of that's our education system that we see is failing kids over and over, um, especially it's disproportionately failing kids of color. Um, and just, uh, you know, job opportunities, just growing, the, uh, just a community overall where, where there's just so many, so many factors that, that are stacked against so many kids. A huge thing was education, how it was being funded, um, housing, uh, so many of my kids, like I said, coming from special education, I did with Severs, I did with Anger, I was head of BSD, um, proper housing, economic uh, accessibility and opportunities for people um, from so many different walks of life. Uh, I saw that we were still dealing with so much supremacy on a level when it came to um, 
you know, fighting against racism, fighting against opportunity, those that were coming home from being incarcerated were still going up against the, the stigma that it was after they've done everything they were supposed to do. Um, my LGBTQIA community was still being discriminated against uh, and when you see these things happening in 2022, 2023, 2024, and ignorance is still triumphing, um, it made sure that I, I had to get going. I had to be a part of it. I needed to fight against the injustices that I saw. And it was really just this drive to, to keep pushing forward. The police wanted to just go with it was grand larceny. It was just a theft. Did you think in that moment, yeah, but there's something about the drugs that doesn't make sense to me. Correct. She was convinced after her sister sent her this NBC News article about 25-year-old Julio Ramirez. She just said, Linda, this is odd, but you need to read this. This just has a weird similarity. Ramirez was found dead in a taxi after leaving the Ritz Bar and Lounge in Hell's Kitchen last April. Police said he died of an apparent drug overdose. The family tells NBC News tens of thousands of dollars were stolen from his accounts, too. It became very clear that this was rampant with many victims and different groups or different rings doing the same thing. How do you watch someone die and then walk out the door and start using their credit cards to drink and eat? Tonight, 10 months after her son's death, two law enforcement officials say there are indictments. The DA issuing arrest warrants for six men allegedly involved in 17 robberies, some facing murder charges. And it doesn't stop there. The medical examiner's office tells NBC News it is involved in the investigation of several additional deaths in similar circumstances. The DA would not comment while the NYPD says it is still investigating. What were some of the, the challenges you had faced? Mm. Uh, especially because we all know locally, right. Albany is known as a big Democratic Party, uh, party right. you know, area. Right. You not being a known person, right. what were the challenges with that? So everyone would say to me, like, you're not known, like, we've never seen you. And I would be like, I've been here for a bit, like, for the past five years. I'm here, you just haven't seen me. Like, you just haven't been looking for me, sorry. Like, my apologies that I haven't been going to your fancy, expensive dinners and fundraisers and talking to all of your fancy people. Um, but I've been a neighbor and resident of this neighborhood just like everyone else. It was like a fun little thing that people said on my campaign, like, she's never, she's new here. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and so, the biggest challenge to your question was also, like not knowing these traditional systems of politics, like not knowing, I mean, you find out, but at first it was very difficult, um, who these like political players are, who these like leaders are locally and statewide that you had to talk to that aren't even like elected officials. There's like a woman that I DM'd on Facebook that had just happened, excuse me, just so happened to be like a very important person in politics that someone was like, you have to message this woman, like she's so important. Um, and frankly, like every time I talked to these leaders in politics, almost every time, um, they were like, oh, you're not gonna like, maybe next time. Like this is like a cool trial run for you. Like good luck, but we can't support you publicly and you're not gonna win. Which obviously just like fueled me more. And you know me, Shay, but that was like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, bet. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're gonna say that. Uh, and I would, I think that was really challenging because as a, like as a young woman, as a young Latina, like as even like as an attorney, like I came into the circle being like, I have this really great campaign and just to hear no so much was challenging. And I would say that was probably the biggest challenge because it was like every single time I heard that I had to like, you know, reinvigorate myself <laughs> to, to be like, no, it's, it, this is worth it and you can do this. But it was um, very frustrating, very challenging in the beginning to hear that a lot. Um, so, here's a, uh, one thing I do want to bring up. So you are not only, you're not just a common council woman, no, no, no. You are the common council woman yeah. of the sixth ward, which is known as the gay mecca. Yes. So, once you got elected, and once, you know, people knew who you were. Yeah. 
obviously I'm assuming you have to then learn about the community here, which again, which is predominantly like on large streams. Well, anyway, it's predominantly LGBTQ yeah. um, and such. What were some of the, the I want to say, what are the three things you kind of learned about the community here as far as the LGBT community, as far as the issues, you know, the so on and so forth. And then what were some challenges? Like I wouldn't say a few, few challenges that you had faced. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, like the three, I could say three things, but the biggest learning moments came from talking to people. And it wasn't like I was, um, specifically saying like I have to talk to this like LGBT um, leader but like it would just happen like that um, and then it was just like people like just from talking to everyone and not having like a boundary or a um, not, not having boundary but like not I'm not like choosing who I'm talking to. Like I'm just going out there and like talking to everyone as much as I possibly can. Like how you and I met was like literally talking on the street, <laughs> you know? So it was, it was in that way that I created, um, continued to create community because like I said, like I was always here in the neighborhood and I had like these really deep connections to the neighborhood um, as a young person, but also as like a young professional in these many different social circles that like I knew a lot of people in the neighborhood, but to your point, when you become elected, you have to like reinvigorate yourself and recommit yourself to, to talk to more people. So um, I would say like during that journey though, of re of, of making sure I'm, I'm reaching out and actively understanding and um, connecting with the LGBT community, I learned in that process that I also had so much to learn about myself and my own allyship, which I really found to be powerful. As a young person, as someone that considers themselves an ally, to acknowledge that there is so much more that one constantly has to learn, and as a leader, you have an obligation to actually make that learning a priority. And so when I'm talking to the community, making these connections, you know, creating mentorships and, and, um, and friendships that uh, you learn during that process. And then um, I have found as well, and this is kind of similar, but within this like learning and speaking out and, and learning the community process, people hold you accountable. And I love that because like, it's so easy to say like, she messed up, I don't give a shit. She sucks. And I'm not sure if I can swear on here. Sorry. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, uh, the language, we, ha we have no language. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so like it was, it's easy to say like that person messed up and like we're gonna ignore them because they suck. But how beautiful that like when I, I, when one makes a mistake that people, the people came out of the woodwork to be like, hey, that was a bad thing. And I, I want you to know and acknowledge that, um, we love you and we care about you. And um, this is something that we wanna teach you and, and, and correct and uplift so that you can be a better leader too, which is just so beautiful. Like who who is in a place to have such comfort and, and such um, patience? So, so your question was like reaching out to the community, understanding, connecting, rekindling, I did so much of that and it was so intense to me and really beautiful and it has, in ways that I've reached out, the community has reached back out in a really um, special way that I've just, I've been like really humbled by it to be honest. <laughs> because like I said, people could just ignore you and they could say like, we don't care about that bitch. But it was just so, you know what I mean? I, I want you to laugh so people can hear you laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not here, laugh. No. Shay is not here right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so like that, that was just special. I really liked that part of the whole like post-election, learning, rekindling, reaching out part. Of all the epidemics we've seen in the US in the last five years, one of the most troubling is the epidemic of hate and hate crimes. And they're up, way up, against Asians and against Jews. Now we're digging deeper into hate crimes against the LGBTQ plus community. Tonight, as we celebrate Pride Month, we focus on those particular crimes, and the numbers really are shocking. There is now a New York cop 
That's her right there, who is focusing solely on those hate crimes and the people affected. Here's investigative reporter Dan Krauth. While we're seeing pride colors on full display across the city, we're also seeing an increase in hate. Like this disturbing attack on the subway caught on video back in March. Police say a man spit on and punched a 22-year-old while yelling anti-gay remarks. No arrest made yet. The case is still under investigation. It kind of like boils my skin because I want to be able to be out there and, and be able to find this person. The other part of me does feel sad because, you know, I want to go and, and hug this person and say, you know what, I, I'm here. Sergeant Anna Arboleda is the LGBTQ liaison with the NYPD. I want people to be visible, be themselves, you know, be their authentic self. She's an out cop and wants others to feel they can be open about their sexuality while walking the streets of New York without getting harmed. The increase in hate crime does make me feel, um, I have mixed feelings about it. And I say mixed feelings because look, it's sad. It's sad to see that there's so much hate in the world because at the same time, it's like, you know, we have somebody that is being a target simply for who they are, right? When we track the numbers, 97 hate crimes against the community reported last year. That's compared to 66 in 2019, the year before the pandemic. That's a 46% increase. And so far this year, more crimes reported compared to years past. We're more visible and because we're also more visible, we're targeted as well. We've mapped out where the crimes are happening. They're all over the city, every borough. It's happening everywhere. We are seeing it in the city where, you know, normally it wasn't like that before. But while the city's experiencing more hate crimes, there are also more people who feel comfortable reporting it to police. Sergeant Arboleda says that's a big difference and a bright spot compared to just a few years ago. I see progress is because that means that the people are out there making more reports. And to me, that's progress between the NYPD and the community, right? That they feel a little bit safer going into the precinct and reporting something that happened to them.